Hello, today is March 4th, 2020. Um, my name is Jessica Taylor. I'm uh, interviewing Pablo Isaza. Is that how you say it? It is, yeah. Okay. For the VOSIS Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Please know that this recorded interview will be placed in the Nettie Lee Benson Latin American Collection at UT Austin, and it may be available online via YouTube or a similar platform. If there's anything you do not wish to answer or talk about, especially given that your recording will appear online, I will honor your wishes. Also, if there is something you wanna talk about, please bring it up and we'll talk about it. Because we are not conducting this interview in person, I need to record you consenting. So I'll ask you a series of five questions. Please say, yes, I agree, or no, I do not agree after each one. There are three questions we need to make sure you agree to before we go on. VOSIS's wish is to archive your interview along with any other photographs and other documentation at the Benson Library at UT Austin. We will retain copyright of the interview and any other materials you donate to VOSIS. Number one, do you give VOSIS consent to archive your interview and your materials at the Benson Library? Yes, I agree. Okay. Do you grant VOSA's copyright over the interview and any material you provide? Yes, I agree. Do you agree to allow us to post this interview on the internet where it may be viewed by people around the world? Yes, I agree. We have many questions in a pre-interview form <laughs> that you have already <laughs> filled out. We use that information from the pre-interview form to help in research. The entire form is kept in a secure VOSA server. Before we send it to the Benson, we will have stripped out any contact information for yourself or family members, so that will not be part of your public file. Your public file will only be accessible at the Benson Library. Do you wish for us to share the rest of your interview in your public file available to researchers at the Benson? Yes, I agree. On occasion, VOSES receives requests from journalists who wish to contact our interview subjects. We only deal with legitimate news outlets. Do you give consent for us to share your phone numbers or your email with journalists? No. Okay, so let's actually do this. <laughs> okay. um, tell me a little bit about your experience with COVID-19. Um, well, you know, it's been about a year, actually, I think next week is in March, like one year. So it has definitely been a really tough time for me and my family, I would say, like, not only, uh, just like financially, but I think mentally, um, as well as like emotionally, uh, I don't think anyone expected it to be prolonged, like for this amount of time, um, at least in the US. But like the biggest thing for me as a student is how mentally draining online classes have been. I would say that's the biggest hit for me. Um, and I know a lot, like just talking about it with a lot of my peers, they would also agree. So, yeah. How did you first learn about COVID-19? I heard about it back in late December early January um, but at that time it sounded like something like we had heard about in the past like Ebola or maybe some other type of disease so it didn't seem super serious like I remember people kind of making jokes about it um, so yeah I think I just read it in like a news outlet. Uh, what was your initial reaction to what was going on um, in uh, December and January? my initial reaction i did not think about it for too long i just thought you know this is just another disease and then they'll figure it out and we'll get over it yeah um what was the point at which you realized uh that it was serious i remember the day that like my mom and like in my house like and some friends of mine like kind of started panicking and then like, I remember the moment feeling like, oh, we have to go to the store and like grab supplies for like the next couple of weeks because things might run out. 
And I think at that moment, panic kind of started setting in. Um, and it was weird. It was a really weird feeling. It felt like you were kind of in a movie, like, like we were going to be stuck, you know, inside for I don't know how long. And like you, you didn't know like food was going to be available or what was going to happen, what the world was going to be like. So um, definitely stressful. Absolutely. So um, you mentioned that COVID had impacted your family. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, it impacted my mom's job, uh, my stepdad's job. They had to start working from home, like adjusting to that balance. I know personally, it also affected me and my work. I had to start working from home. I missed out on some job opportunities because of it, um, just because in the field that I'm in, that type of work wasn't being handled at the time. Um, because of COVID, because of the restrictions and people didn't know how to like handle it, like a lack of preparation, I would say. Um, so that part financially was hard. And then academically, I definitely felt like institutions were not prepared to format that kind of online learning experience. Um, so yeah, it was tough. It was hard. Um, what do you what do you do for work where it impacted you in this? So at the time I was working with an electrical engineering firm. I was an electrical designer for them. And of course, we had to transition to fully work from home. Um, and at the time, since a lot of the work that we were given was like government contracted, then we had to stop a lot of our um, operations just because, you know, um, of course, like a lot of the things that we were doing were in person. Um, we had to do like some building, some construction. So none of that could happen. And so that, that had to stop. Um, so, yeah. Um, and what about your parents? What did, what did they do where it affected their work? I know for my mom, um, she works in the public sector and it affected some of her contracts. So she's a consultant. Um, and just because of like, I guess the lack of people being able to go into the offices and whatever, um, contracts were not being handed out as often as they were before. So, yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of other organizations you're involved in, like church or fraternities or um, anything like that, um, are, there, are there ways that they were affected by COVID? Um, yeah, so obviously, like, I wasn't super involved with church, but I still got, you know, all the emails and everything. And yeah, they just started doing online mass. They probably handle it better than most uh, other organizations that I know, honestly. And um, at the time, I wasn't with any fraternities or anything like that, so. Um, you know, the, the church uh, component is something that um, the people involved in the project are interested in. Um, so you, can you say a little bit more about how that affected you moving from real mass, <laughs> like mm -hmm. in mass to, to online mass? Um, yeah, so I would say at that point, we weren't going to mass super often, but I do remember like all youth group activities were kind of put on hold for that time and then later on like the church developed like like a zoom type of um session or mass holding so yeah like they would just send you the link they would be like you know this is how we're gonna do mass from now on but that was later on that was like it took them like a, a few weeks for sure to set that up so um did it affect things like christmas mass or anything like that um, that you may be more likely to go to? Yeah, for sure. I'm, uh, my parents are Catholic, both of them, so religion is a big part um, of their lives. And we, I mean, they, we haven't gone to church in, since, you know, the outbreak happened, so, yeah. Um, do you remember specific moments where they were affected by not being able to go? Um... I wouldn't say it affected them like super harshly emotionally just because they you know you can still pray at home and you can still I guess live a fulfilling religious life in that way um 
but it's kind of like a tradition just to go. Um, and I know they did enjoy it. It was, you know, something that they did on, on the weekends. And of course, like Christmas mass, I'm sure they missed it, so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, beyond your immediate family, um, did COVID affect any extended family members um, in any way that comes to mind? Um, I don't think any of my family members actually had COVID, fortunately. So, um, and most of them live outside of the country anyways. So they were not super affected. I mean, my family always did a good job at like staying home and kind of isolating. Uh, so yeah, we, we just were not super affected by like the illness itself, you know, um, and like being contagious or anything like that, so. Yeah. Totally. Um, just in terms of experience, how was your family outside of the country affected? Well, they live in Colombia, and I mean, to this day, like cities are still pretty under lockdown. Um, and I know my grandparents were like terrified of it, not only because of the like repercussions of the illness of the you know disease, but also just because like since it is a third world country, you don't know when you might get vaccines. You don't know um, how the healthcare system might react to it. I mean, like in the U.S., it's very very different than in, in those countries. Um, and I lived in Colombia for 14 years, so I know about it. I just remember like them being pretty scared to even see like my uncles and my my little cousins, like from March all the way up to like I think Christmas time. It, barely saw each other so yeah uh how did you stay in contact with folks from columbia um during the pandemic through through whatsapp mainly like social media um so we would we would like have family zooms i remember that um we like even with um cousins that we hadn't seen seen in a long time but like yeah for christmas and all that we had like zoom meetings um, whereas, you know, of course, in other years, maybe we would go and visit them, but yeah, so that's how we handle it. Absolutely. Um, so in terms of uh, who you physically interacted with, um, have you done a lot of traveling um, since the pandemic started? No, I, I mean, I haven't left Virginia since, so. I think the first time I even left, um, I was in Fairfax at the time. That's where my family lives, like the Fairfax Annandale, like North of Virginia area. Um, and I, I think I didn't leave until I had to come back to Tech, so in like August. And so I've, I've just been traveling from Blacksburg to my parents' house. That's the only really travel I've, I've done. Um. This is a, a weird one, but how has your how has uh, your family changed what you take with you when you leave your home? Maybe between a lot of a lot of hand sanitizer for sure, and the cars. Like I remember, I mean, in the beginning, especially it was like running out. So like I think my parents like ordered it from some online site or whatever, and it took like a few weeks for it to hit us. Like fortunately, we had some in the house, but I remember like. Um, Oh, oh my god like one of the main things was we would disinfect all of our food right after we would come from like the grocery store like I don't know if other people have been doing that or, or whatnot but like all produce um everything like we had to disinfect it like we had like areas in the house where we would keep food from the point where it was from like Costco or the grocery store or wherever we were at in our house and that was like the designated area and then we would clean it and then we would store it in the fridge like um, my, my brother, he worked at Whole Foods and he was not like the work clothes that he would have were not like allowed in the house. So he would have to like change before coming in the house and like immediately wash those clothes. And so a lot of like life, I guess, in that sense changed. So, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so what about wearing masks? Um, how do you and your family feel about wearing masks? Uh, I mean, we, we never had a problem with wearing masks or following like any of those mandates. So um, 
I think we struggled in the beginning to like find the right mask. Like we didn't really know. I think some people like didn't know if they were like N95s or like those regular like I guess blue-ish masks that um, like nurses and stuff wear or used to wear. Um, but we, yeah, I mean, we ordered like our own masks and we washed them. We have like, I think everyone in my family has like a few that they just kind of rotate out, so. And we talked about this a little bit, um, but COVID has changed the way that you receive education. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about why that's been challenging? Yeah, so I would say colleges are not very, very well prepared, especially in the beginning to give an online format. I know with myself and a lot of my friends, um, it's it's such a different learning environment from going to in-person. And I know like even professors feel that way. Um, and it's, it's just like such a weird time in the world, you know? Like it feels like school is not like the most important thing at times, like there's so much else going on. Like, I don't really know if like calculus homework is really the most important thing in my life right now. So, um, I mean, that's on one part. And then, and the second it's the format, you know, the way tests are giving, are given. Um, I know like, from a stress standpoint, um, a lot of people don't like lockdown browsers because they feel like it like disturbs their privacy, like having to show your whole home and like every single movement and everything. That's, um, it just makes people feel really uncomfortable. And I get it that obviously there's honor codes that you need to follow, but it, you can't, you know, move away or like, just look the other way when people tell you that their mental health is not okay because of it. Um, so yeah, I mean, just being in Zoom, obviously you try to make the most of it and, and waking up and trying to go to class and keep yourself like focused, but it's definitely such a big change from being on campus and like actually going to physical class rather than just like waking up and like maybe even having your computer on your bed and going through like the motions. Like that's, in my opinion, that's not really like learning. Like at that point, you're just completing assignments. And I think um, that's not what college should be about and that's not what universities should be about. You're trying to be in an environment that um, helps you learn and guides you to like achieve, you know, maybe like future things in life. And at that point, you're just going through the motions of schoolwork. So yeah, that's what I think. Um, in terms of what's helped you get through it, do you have resources um, or tools that you have employed in order to keep going? <laughs> in um, yeah, I mean, you. I've tried to like set a pretty busy schedule, at least with like working out and like doing stuff outside of the house. I think that's one of the biggest issues that I've encountered and also just people my age have like encountered like you're just inside your house all the time and that can be very draining. Um, just because, I mean, we're humans, most of us need like social contact, you know, we need to talk to other people. Um, and so having a schedule is definitely super useful. I think going out for a walk or a run is also um, pretty great. Like I have, this past year, I learned about like the Pomodoro method, um, the technique. So that's been super great for me personally, because it keeps me like motivated. Um, I know like in the beginning, I was just trying to, I, I said like, okay, I'm just gonna stay in my room, like do like eight hours of work. But when you do that for like months at a time and like don't talk to anyone that can be, you know, that can affect your mental health. Um, so yeah, just doing that. I might put like sticky notes like around my room or whatever, like tell me to complete tasks. I think that's mainly what I've been doing, so. Um, were there particular classes that proved challenging or like particular moments in um, spring or fall that were challenging for you? Um, yeah, like I used to work around 30 hours a week and I was a full-time student also. So having to transition from like that routine of like, I would go to work from like 6 a.m., 7 a.m. And then I would have my classes and everything to now everything's like online and you know, work is just weird and like no one really knows how they're gonna manage it. And also like school is not very clear, like the way tests are, are giving. So I would say spring of 2020 was like super hard. Um, March, April, May, so yeah. 
Absolutely. Um, so as knowledge of COVID came out over the course of 2020, um, how did your concerns about your own health and the health of your family change? Um, well, I think like, especially in the beginning, we didn't really know who was mainly at risk. Like, I think we understood that people with pre-existing conditions were mainly at risk. So my parents, I was like super scared to be like around them or like to see anyone. Like we kept a pretty close circle. Um, just, it was really just me and my brother and my mom and my stepdad for like a lot of months. Um, so yeah, I think it was just scary. Like you didn't want to be the person that gave your parents something and you also didn't want to get it because you like you didn't know what was going to happen. So it was a, it was a bit frightening at first, yeah. Um, you've mentioned mental health a couple of times. Um, do you want to expand on that from a personal perspective? Yeah. Um, so I think like we were all pretty used to a, a way of living before COVID and it's kind of hard to understand that we're most likely not gonna be like that ever again or like as a person like understand there's life pre-COVID and there's life post-COVID like it's it has changed so much about our lives and it will continue to change it just because of the precedent that it set in um and that's hard to like understand I mean you want I mean there was nothing more than like you know you would want to be able to go to like the movies or a concert or whatever but I mean, you just don't know how likely it's going to be. And on top of that, you have to stress about, okay, I have to keep on having my responsibilities and, um, you know, paying my bills, getting schoolwork done. And maybe like, I don't have enough money because COVID, you know, financially just set us back. And on top of that, the government is not really helping out right now. So it, it's a lot of stuff. Um, kind of tied down together and it's all connected to like at some point or another and um it can be hard you know so yeah were there moments where you realized like mentally or emotionally this is difficult um yeah especially like i would say financially when you didn't feel super comfortable like that's mainly when i felt like that, like you, you just, it's stressful, you know, not having like enough money to feel like you can go to the grocery store or whatever. Um, that can be impactful a lot on your mental health. Um, yeah. So on top of that, having like 10 assignments through the week and then I don't know, you have to maybe like your mom got sick. Like I remember my mom got sick at some point during like May or June. And obviously we were super scared because we didn't know what was going on. Like, Thankfully, it wasn't that she, she just got sick from like the, the cold or whatever else. But, you know, she if she was bad for like a couple of weeks and we didn't know what was going on. You like tests also in the beginning. Testing was super weird in the beginning. I don't know if people talk about that, but it wasn't like like people paid hundreds of dollars for tests because they weren't um, easily accessible. It's a, it's a similar situation to what's happening now with, with the vaccines that people were like, you know, only like, I guess political figures and like the most important people were getting vaccines, not the general population. So, yeah. Um, well, that was gonna be, you know, one of my next questions is, um, how did how did access to healthcare change for you over the course of the last year? Well, thankfully I, my family and I have a good healthcare um, provider. So we're really blessed in that way, but, um, so, I mean, in that regards, nothing changed. Like we were super blessed because we had healthcare, but I mean, I cannot imagine what it must've been for people that like maybe didn't, like if they got sick, I, I don't even know how hospitals or, or ICUs or anything handle that or how much the costs were. So like imagine being sick and then you go to like an ICU and on top of that, you can't pay your bills and like everything's just falling down. Like it must've been awful for a lot of people, so. Yeah, definitely. So um, speaking of vaccines, um, 
how do you feel about the vaccine rollout at this point? Um, I mean, I'm glad that they're starting to roll it out. I mean, later is better than never, you know. But um, yeah, like I, I don't know if the guidelines are super clear to when people are going to start getting it. I actually received an email about a week ago from my healthcare provider saying like, we'll put you on a wait list. So I think right now that's how they're handling it. But I would gladly take the vaccine. I, I would have no problem with it. So yeah. Um, how does your family feel about it? They feel the same way. I mean, they're already on the wait list. So yeah. Okay. Um, so um, another thing that came up briefly is um, about the government response. Um, mm -hmm. How do you believe politics has affected how COVID has been handled? Oh man. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, people talk a lot about um, like it's political propaganda and like, I guess mm -hmm. It's like they were trying to say some politicians were lying about it to make it seem like whatever. I don't, I don't even want to get like too much into that. Like, I don't really understand exactly what's happening or what people were doing for political gain. I just think the U.S. being the U.S., being the country that it is, it should have handled it a lot better than it did. Um, and I think whoever was in charge, like whether it was like Democrats, Republicans, or whatever you want to call it, like, I don't think they... They handle it well and they they should have done more for society here and and its citizens um and protecting them not only with like physically so with vaccines with testing with mask mandates but also understanding that a lot of these people were going through um huge amount of stress because they lost their jobs because of unemployment and there should have been some financial incentives to maybe keep them healthier in that way. And I think they failed largely and that compared to a lot of other countries that managed to keep their citizens safe. Um, let's see. Have you been looking for work again since COVID started? Um, um, I've been a full-time student since, so no. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Um, we talked a little bit about finances already. Um, do you um, do you contribute financially to your family, um, either your immediate family or your extended family? Um. Yeah. I mean, I pay for like my own stuff. I don't pay like their mortgage or anything like that, but I you know, take care of a decent amount of my own um, costs, so yeah. Okay, um, has COVID, I mean, we've talked a little bit about this, but has COVID affected your ability to continue to do that? Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, it's the same issue, like a lot of my work was given through contracts and that stopped because of COVID, because like the federal government wasn't, wasn't running anything at that point, so, yeah. Um, how has that affected your career aspirations for like post-grad life? Um, I think maybe I would have wanted to save up a little bit more money that I had and like maybe save that for like grad studies or whatever. So I had to use a lot of the savings that I had on like this year just to like live, so. Yeah, that's how it affected me. Um, are there any concerns in your family at this point about documentation status like that that have changed since the last year happened? Mm, documentation status regarding what exactly? Like immigration? No, no. Um, so there's also a lot of social movements happening. Um, mm -hmm at the same time that all of this is going on. Um, what current social movements have affected your daily life um, in the last year? Um, I mean, obviously the Black Lives Matter movement has been huge. Like that's been the biggest thing.
thing along with COVID, I think for the past year. Um, uh, the way it's affected me is I'm definitely, like I definitely support it. I'm definitely a lot more socially conscious, I think to what maybe I was like ignorant about a few years ago. Um, just try to learn more about it. Trying to understand um, what some people go through, like African Americans um, in our country. Um, and yeah, just trying to. That's that's how I've su supported it. I didn't go to any rallies or anything like that specifically, um, but just from my own personal view, that I support it. So yeah. Um, were there particular moments that expanded your thinking on this that made you pay attention to it, for example? Yeah, I mean, one of the main things was the, you know, January 6th and the Capitol riots. Um, I think seeing like all those people kind of inflict so much violence on what is supposed to be like a sacred, well, not sacred, but maybe like a really important place in, in this nation and like such an important building and like seeing police officers kind of just let them in and, and create that much chaos and the whole world was watching. That was super crazy to me. Like literally the whole world was watching everyone. That was the only thing people talked about for about a week. And like, uh, you know, no one was tear gas. No one was um, to the extent of what happened in Black Lives Matters protests all over the country, which were still happening. Like, to a certain degree at that point. Um, I think that, I mean, it just helped like cement the fact that there's um, huge racial inequality in the US and that it's very real and that we're still living through it. Like racism is, is not a thing of like the 17 or 18 or 1900s. Like it exists like right now. We're, go we're still going through it today, so. I think that was a big moment. I was really, really um, combination of mad, sad, frustrated, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Has COVID influenced um, the way you think about these inequalities? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, a lot of people that lost their jobs that were unemployed were people of color. Um, who also couldn't even apply for unemployment benefits. So yeah, of course. I mean, they were hugely influenced by that. Um, one of the things you had said earlier was that um, there are more important things than like this homework assignment. Um, yeah. what, what has been on your mind? Like what's been foremost on your mind um, the last year when it comes to like that shift away from school? What are you thinking about more than you would be? Um, I would say we have a lot, like, I think I realized that as a person, you kind of have a lot more power and you're more, a lot more impactful than I think you realize that you are, especially when groups of people come together. And like, sometimes maybe as individuals, we don't really realize that. Um, so, you know, like, with all of these movements, with everything happening, I think my mind was just like, wow, we need not only reforms in a lot of the systems that we have in place in the country, um, but like people that will lead these changes and people that are genuinely want the better for society, um, not just individual gain or maybe like corporate gain, which I see a lot of. Um, and it's, they kind of already do it in our faces and they don't really, you know, they, they they don't care but yeah i just think there need to be maybe better political leaders in the country so yeah do you feel differently about the government response in 2021 um than you did um maybe a little less than a year ago in 2020 um regarding like the change and from trump to biden is that what you're referring to yeah definitely or yeah just the change in strategy overall well, I haven't really seen a change in strategy, to, like, to be completely honest with you, with Biden. I mean, maybe there's, like, a change in who controls, you know, like, whatever, like, the House and the Senate. And, uh, but, at, like, I haven't seen huge change. Uh, 
you know, the promises that they made, they're still out there. And just because the person in charge changes doesn't mean that things are actually going to change. So, yeah. Absolutely. Um, is there anything else you wanted to share about your experiences with COVID that we haven't talked about yet? Um, no, I mean, I, the only thing I would say is professors, at least in my experience, have been super understanding. Like, I think they're kind of, a lot of them are going through the same thing that us students are going through. Um, so with my experience with the professors themselves, not the institutions, not the universities, they have been pretty great to be completely honest. Like, at least, I mean, personally, like my professors have been super understanding. They know like, and even they have more stuff going on. Like I know a few of them have gotten sick with COVID. So they understand what it's like. Um, so I think, yeah, I don't know exactly who's running stuff behind the scenes or what's going on. Like, but from like a personal level, you know, when I speak to individuals, I think everyone's pretty much on the same page. So there's a huge disconnect at some point. I just don't know where it is at. That's all. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much.